Now, when we look at the book of Daniel, it's divided into two parts. How many parts, everybody? Two parts. Okay, I got to put on my teaching mode and not a preaching mode here. Two parts. Now, the book of Daniel has 12 chapters. The first six chapters are largely stories, with the exception of chapter 2, which is a prophecy. The last six chapters are prophecies. The stories tell us how, the prophecies tell us when. Now, the prophecies of Daniel do not tell us when our Lord is going to return. Anytime you hear somebody telling you those dates, you know they're fanciful interpretations of the Bible. So the Bible doesn't tell us that at all. But it does give us broad strokes. It gives us the rise and fall of nations throughout history. And we will look at those. And it's not guesswork. You can actually read the names of the nations. In fact, the Bible named... 150 years before he was born, Cyrus, by name, as the ruler that would attack Babylon, overthrow it, and let the Jews go free. It's an incredibly amazing prophecy that I'll look with you at next week. But so the stories tell us how. The stories tell us how to get through crisis. The stories tell us how to thrive in tough times. The stories tell us that when everything around you is collapsing, how to hang on. So the stories of the book of Daniel are not simply pre-primers. They're not simply stories to tell us the good bedtime stories, not at all. They're stories that build faith, stories that build courage, stories that build hope. So when you look, for example, at Daniel chapter 1 that we'll look at tonight, we see that story as a reflection of an end time crisis, and we discover the character qualities to get through that crisis. We look at the prayer life of Daniel, the courage of Daniel. We look at Daniel in the lion's den. I almost got myself off because, well, I'll tell you the story. Have you ever hugged a lion? Have you ever hugged a lion? I hugged a lion. A real lion. No, I did. I did. I hugged a lion. And I've got a picture to prove it. Um, Teeny, that picture is down in the study. I think it's still down there. Go get the picture of a... I'll get, send my wife running down. She needs exercise because she's 70, getting ready for another marathon. Okay, here's the story. I was with It Is Written Television for many, many years. And my mentor on It Is Written Television was Pastor George Vandeman. Pastor Vandeman had uh, done a series on marriage called How to Live with a Tiger. That was the title. Now, I'm not saying whether the woman was the tiger or the man was the tiger. I'm not saying it was a male or female tiger. Are you with me now? So he did a series on how to live with a tiger. He was an incredibly in creative mind. So he brought a, a baby tiger to the TV studio, and they put it on the desk as he was giving the lecture. Well, the tiger got a little frisky and jumped on him and ripped up his suit. So when I joined the staff of It Is Written Television, Pastor Vanneman said to me, look, we're going to do a series with Daniel and the Lions Den, but I'm not taping with the lion. You tape with the lion. So I thought to myself, oh, brother, taping with a lion. So I said, okay, I'll tape with the lion. So what happened was they brought the lion into the TV studio. This is a preview of what you're going to get as we study Daniel and the lion. They bring the lion into the TV studio. Everybody leaves. Now, when they... Have you ever seen the Cadbury candy commercials? How many of you see? Or MGM. Have you ever seen MGM with the lion? Well, that lion's name is Joseph, and that's the lion I taped with. There are two working lions in Hollywood, and so the one I did with was Joseph. So they bring Joseph into the, 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 the TV studio, and when they did this at CBS, they put all the camera people in cages. But they took everybody out of my studio. Everybody was out. And as they did, they bring this lion in, and he's on a chain, and he's pulling the... the, the the, the tr lion trainer. So the lion trainer had a large pouch on his side full of this bloody meat. And he takes it out and he says, uh, thank you, dear. I was a little younger in this picture, but we can still use it. <laughs> so here I am hugging this lion in our TV studio. I mean, that thing was huge. I'm telling you, that thing is huge. So anyway, you, you see this lion with Pastor Philly hugs? How'd you like to hug a lion, huh? When you're in heaven, you can hug a lion. <laughs> So, you know, so what happened was he, the, the trainer had this large thing of meat on his side, and he took the lion off the chain, and he said to me, now, Dr. Finley, don't worry, 
because if the lion gets frisky, I'll do this. And he took this punk of bloody meat out of his hand. He threw it across the studio. And the lion leaped on it. Just, he said, now, that's what's going to happen. If that lion gets frisky with you, I'll just take this meat out and throw it across, and he'll jump on it. Well, that didn't give me much reassurance, I'll tell you. But I will tell you the rest of the story, taping with the lion. That's why you have to keep coming, because if I told you everything now, why are you going to come back? But I'll tell you about taping with the lion when he opened his mouth and my head was there. No, I'm not going to tell you that tonight. All right, so Daniel, what does Daniel say? First six chapters are stories. But the stories tell us about faith. The stories tell us about courage. The last six chapters are prophecies. They tell us about the rise and fall of nations. They tell us about end time events. Now, what is the purpose of prophecy in the Bible? Twofold. Number one, to prepare for the future. Uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Surely, certainly, the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So the great events in history, God outlines in advance so his people will be prepared. But there's another reason for prophecy. And if you have a Bible, and if you don't have one, you can probably find one in the pew. I want you to look at a Bible text. It's found in John chapter 14, verse 29. John chapter 14, verse 29. Jesus himself gives us the reason for Bible prophecy. And Jesus talks about prophecy. And Jesus says this in John 14, verse 29. Now, you're, if you're not familiar with the Bible, don't worry about that because I'll help you. I'll work you through it. Never be embarrassed about what you don't know. Does anybody need a Bible? Ms. Finley has some Bibles. If you need one, just raise your hand. If you're not familiar with the Bible, the Bible is divided into two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament books of the Bible are the books written before Jesus, the New Testament starts with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of the Gospels look at Jesus' life from a different perspective. Matthew was a tax collector. You want to read about the sermons of Christ, you read Matthew. Mark, you read about the humanity of Christ, that he came, he dwelt among us, the Son of Man. Uh, Luke who was a doctor. He talks about the parables of Christ, the stories of Christ. And John is on the divinity of Christ. Uh, John was written to a Jewish mindset to understand the divinity of Christ. So you're looking at John chapter 14, verse 29. What is the purpose of Bible prophecy? Jesus said this, Now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So Jesus says the purpose of Bible prophecy is that when you look back at prophecy and you see that this prediction has come to pass, you can do what? What does it do? You can believe. So an understanding of prophecy builds your faith. It, you look back on it, you say, the Bible's not a book of myths and fables. I know when I was 17 years old, I was looking for meaning and purpose in my life, looking for something that I could hold on to, something that would be solid. And I began to look at the, I was always interested in history, and so I began to look at the historicity of the Bible, and it really changed my life. Once I began to understand that you can have confidence in the Word of God. So why do we study prophecy? Why do we spend eight weeks coming here, reviewing the 12 chapters in the book of Daniel? First, that prophetic word helps us to prepare our own lives for the future. Helps us to develop a character that stands through the crisis that this world's going to face. Most thinkers in our world tonight recognize that this world's on the verge of a stupendous crisis that we're almost to the breaking point, that you can't be $20 trillion in debt in America and not be at the breaking point. You can't have European economies that are so far in debt and not be in the breaking point. You can't have nuclear weaponry in the hands of Iran, Iraq, North Korea, etc., and not be at the breaking point. You, there is never a weapon made that hasn't been used. And so when you look around the world tonight, you ask me, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm very optimistic because I look at it through the eyes of the Bible, because I know what the end chapter is all about. I know that the kingdom of God is going to triumph and Christ's plan is going to triumph. But if I didn't look at the Bible through the lens, if I didn't look at the world through the lens of the Bible, when you look at the poverty in our world, you look at the haves and the have-nots in our world, if you come with me to India and you walk their streets and have young people grabbing your feet and asking you for another morsel of food, you come with me to China, you go to Russia, you, you travel to Africa, 
you, you look at the world, and if you look at it objectively, this world is in very, very serious trouble. But knowing that the world is in the hands of God, you know, I remember that old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. So why is it that we study prophecy first to prepare for the future, second to build confidence in the Bible? Now, why study the book of Daniel? Why do we choose that? Why don't we choose another one of the books? We'll be, we'll be studying other books as time goes on, but why don't we study another book? In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, and what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to put the text on the screen for some of you that may not be conversant. But if you have your Bible, you're conversant with Scripture, you can look at them in the Bible. To get the most out of the class, you can be looking either at the screen or the Bible. But Matthew chapter 24 is a chapter that Jesus gives on end-time events. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the final events of this earth's history. And uh, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. So Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. As he's sitting there, he looks out over the Jewish temple. The temple had been destroyed in the days of Solomon, but it was rebuilt by Zerubbabel and enlarged by Herod. And Herod spent years, decades, rebuilding this temple. So Jesus looks down at the Jewish temple, and he says to his disciples, Matthew 24, verse 2. That's chapter 24 of Matthew the second verse. And Jesus said to them, don't you see all the things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another. So Jesus speaks about the destruction of the Jewish temple. The disciples don't recognize that he's talking about A.D. 70 when Titus will come down and destroy the temple. So the disciples think he must be talking about the end of the world because any event that would be as cataclysmic as the destruction of the temple must be the end of the world. So Jesus blends two events, events that would lead up to the end of the world and also events that would lead up in the first century to the destruction of the temple. So Jesus begins to say, talks about verse 6, if you have your Bible, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled, the end is not yet. Verse 7, he talks about nation rise against nation. He talks about famines, natural disasters like earthquakes. He talks about rising crime and violence, false religion. He talks about the gospel going to the ends of the earth. Then Jesus makes this amazing statement in verse 15. So the question is, why study the book of Daniel? Jesus makes this amazing statement, Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So in the context of Matthew chapter 24, in the context of end events, in the context of the last days of human history. Jesus says, Daniel is a prophet. Understand what Daniel says. If you want to get through the crisis of the close of this earth's history, understand the book of Daniel. So if Jesus says to read and understand Daniel, it must be important, right? If Jesus says to you and to me, look, understand the book of Daniel. It'll provide character quality clues to you. To understand this book, you'll have more courage. You'll have more faith. You'll know how to thrive in the tough times ahead. Your prayer life will be deeper. If you will come each week to these classes, by the time we get done, you will feel a deeper faith. You'll feel closer to God. You'll have a more vibrant experience with God. You'll have a deeper Bible study experience. And you will face the future not afraid, but you'll face the future with a heart filled with hope. Now, have you ever begun to read a book by looking at the last chapter first? Now, come on now, be honest with me. Be honest with me. How many of you have ever looked at the last chapter of a book? Uh, a few people like me, you know, if I look at the last chapter and I don't like the conclusion, why am I going to spend all my time reading that book, right? Now, so tonight we're going to start with the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Just a few verses, then we're going to go to chapter 1. So we start with the last chapter. Daniel 12, verse 4. Now, how do I find the book of Daniel? Daniel is one of the Old Testament prophets. So here's a simple way to find Daniel. If you have your Bible and you cut it in, and, you, and you open halfway through, you're going to come to the book of Psalms normally. Then you go Psalms, then you go Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Ecclesiastes is in there too. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. So Daniel is a little bit beyond halfway through the, the book. A little bit beyond halfway through the book of Daniel. Daniel has 12 chapters. Now, what are the two divisions of Daniel? We have in Daniel, what do we have? Stories and what else? Prophecies. Oh, That's a good class. So I knew it was. All right. We're going to the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel 12, verse 4. Daniel is given instruction, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. I've heard this text interpreted in a variety of ways. Some people have said, you know, 95% of all the scientists that live in the world live in the world today, so knowledge is increasing in the world. We must be in the time of the end. That might be an application of the prophecy, but it's really not as clear in the text itself. You see, God says to Daniel, you shut up the words of this prophecy, and you seal this book until the time of the end. Then many are going to run to and fro. You know, the Old Testament is written, Daniel's written in two languages, Aramaic and Hebrew. But the Hebrew says many are going to leaf back and forth, and knowledge, that is knowledge about the prophecies of Daniel, are going to increase. So this is a fulfillment of what Jesus said. Jesus said, at the end of time, or last days of verse history, if you want to be filled with faith, hope, and courage, when everything seems to be falling apart around you, when the ground beneath your feet is shaking, when you're nervous about that, if you want to be filled with hope, you want to be filled with courage, look at the book of Daniel, Jesus says. Now you come to the book of Daniel, and it says, Daniel, shut up the words. So the angel Gabriel, who gave the prophecy to Daniel, says, shut up the words. Seal the book till the time of the end. Then, then many will rediscover Daniel. They'll leaf to and fro. They'll, they'll read the pages. They'll, they'll go through the pages of Daniel. And the knowledge of Daniel's prophecies are going to increase. That's the whole intent here. That run to and fro in Hebrew is leaf back and forth through the, through the pages. You don't see it as clearly in English. Now, if you continue to go through Daniel 12, you look at Daniel 12, verse 6. One said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river. This is the angel that spoke to Daniel. How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? So the question is asked, when are these prophecies of Daniel going to be fulfilled? Daniel 12, verse 8. Although I heard, Daniel said, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? In other words, this prophecy is going to speak to us down to the last days of human history. Look, Daniel 12, verse 9. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. You find that throughout Daniel chapter 12, Daniel 12, verse 13. It's this glorious refrain, these two words, the end, the end. But, but you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So what is Daniel chapter 12 trying to tell us? What's Daniel chapter 12 trying to say? Basically, it's saying this, that the prophecies of the book of Daniel will find meaning and purpose at a period of time when this earth is in a major crisis. And that we can find hope and courage through that crisis as we go through the book of Daniel. We can find strength for that crisis as we go through the book of Daniel. Now let me hasten to add, in our class we're going to look at three things about every chapter of Daniel. Number one, what does this chapter say about the character of God? Every chapter, what does chapter 1 say about the character of God? What does chapter 2 say about the character of God? What does chapter 3 say about the character of God? Then we're going to look at, secondly, what does this chapter say about my life today? What does this chapter say about my life today? Let me raise some questions. How can a woman who's been diagnosed with breast cancer, and she's been in chemotherapy for four months, how can she sit in this class tonight when we get done with chapter 1 of Daniel, and you will see and be helped. How can a person going through the trauma of divorce go through a class, Daniel chapter 7, and really come away with strength and help? How can somebody that's struggling with their kids, strung out in drugs, go through the chapter of Daniel 3 and be helped? How can somebody be out of work and be helped? How can somebody looking for purpose, meaning, and direction in their life be helped as we study Daniel? So every chapter, I'm going to look at three things. What does this chapter say about the character of God? What does this chapter say about my life today? And what does this chapter say about the overall picture, the large picture of the crisis at the close of this earth's history? Now, let me tell you what we're not going to do. If you're expecting fanciful dates to be given, you will not find them in this class. 
We're not going to give you fanciful dates. We're not going to give you speculation. I want to provide for you solid biblical study that is life transformational, that just gets into our hearts and changes our lives. Material that, for you, I'll give you the history and the background, but every chapter we're going to look at spiritual lessons. So Daniel is a book for the end time. It's a book that helps us to know what God is like. It's a book that helps us to know how to get through personal crisis, and it's a book that helps us to get through end time crisis. Now, the name of the book that we're studying is the book of what, everybody? Daniel. Now, I want you to look here at the name of Daniel. If you take the name of Daniel, if you see a Bible name and it has E-L at the end, that comes from Elohim, the name of God. So, like Michael, E-L, the name of God at the end. So, always Dan was the tribe of Judges, L is God. So, if you look at dan Yell. It literally means, his name means, the God of judgment and justice. In other words, the God who sets all things right. In the Hebrew culture, a judge was not somebody that was against you. He was somebody that was for you. A judge was one that stood for you. So the book of Daniel is about the final judgment. It's about the God that will set all things right. In the rise and fall of the destiny of nations, God is going to set all things right. In the injustice of the world, God is going to set all things right. In the oppression of the world, God is going to set all things right. In all the challenges of the world, God is going to set all things right. In the crisis of the clothes, when it looks like evil is triumphing over righteousness, God is going to set all things right. That's incredibly good news, isn't it? So when I look at the name of the book, and it's true in your life as well, it may be at times that you feel oppressed. It may be at times that the forces of hell seem to be oppressing you. It may be at times you're afflicted with sickness. There may be difficulty in your home, in your marriage. But the book of Daniel speaks to you tonight. It speaks of a God that's greater than any difficulty you ever face. It speaks of a God that's greater than any problem you'll ever, ever go through. It speaks of a God that will set all things right. He's the God of justice and judgment. Has anybody ever asked you this question? If God's so good, why is the world so bad? If, if there is a God, you know, as I lecture in university campuses, that's one of the biggest questions. The question is, if there is a God, why are our children starving to death in India? If there is a God, how could God be fair and let a baby be born HIV positive? And the answer to that question is threefold. Number one, what we see in our world is the outplay of a world that's in rebellion against God. What we see in our world is the, the suffering in our world is the corporate result, not so the individual result, but the corporate result of a, of a sinful world that we live in. That's the first answer. The second question is this, when you go through suffering and you're treated unfairly and unjustly, God is always there by your side. He is there to give you strength and courage. He has not left you alone. But the third answer to that question is this, we may suffer for a little while in this life, but God's going to set all things right. He is going to set all things right. And that at the end of time, there'll be no sickness, suffering, heartache, or death. So the name Daniel, God of the justice and judgment. Now we begin with the first chapter of the book of Daniel. We need to go back to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. Because in the first chapter of the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1, you have the introduction of the great controversy theme. Now, unless you understand the great controversy theme, you will not understand the Bible. That one theme is the mystery that unlocks the entire Bible. Once you understand that, things begin, all kind of lights begin to go on in your mind. Do you know that in the Treasury Building in Washington, D.C., there are 1,800 doors? That's a little trivia question. 1,800 doors in the Treasury Building. You know how many keys? There's one master key that one person has that can open 1,800 doors in the Treasury Building. I'm going to give you one key that unlocks the mystery of understanding the Bible, and here it is. If you understand this, that the teaching of the Bible is that God created a perfect world. He's no, in no way responsible for evil. But he gave to every one of his creatures the ability to choose. And Lucifer rebelled against God, a rebel angel rebelled against God, and that this world is in the middle of a controversy between good and evil. That when our first parents fell, they opened a door God wanted forever shut. And so you look at the Bible through the eyes of the great controversy. You look at the Bible through the eyes of a conflict between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. 
So when you look at the Bible through those eyes, you begin to understand it. Now, Daniel 1, verse 1. Can you read it from the screen with me, please? In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, let's look at that text. You have two kings, Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar. You have two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. Jerusalem represented all that was right, all that was true. It represented goodness and greatness. It represented the people of God. It represented the truth of God. So Jerusalem is the city of righteousness, the city in which men and women worship the true God. Babylon is a city against the principles of God. It was filled with idolatry. So in the third year of, of Jehoiakim, what year was that? 605 B.C. 605 B.C. At this time, Daniel was, 22, was about 17 years old. Daniel was born about in 622 B.C., and I'll show you how we know that a little later. So this is 605 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar attacks uh, Jerusalem. He besieges it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem three times. Here are your dates. 605 B.C., he attacks Jerusalem. 596, he attacks Jerusalem. 587, he attacks Jerusalem. The first time he attacks Jerusalem in 605, what he does is this. He takes Daniel captive with some captives and young men, brilliant, back to Babylon. And I'll give you a little geography and history lesson shortly. Second time he attacks uh, Jerusalem in... Uh, 596, he takes 10,000 captives with him. The third time he attacks in 587, he totally destroys the city. Why does Nebuchadnezzar attack Jerusalem? Here's why. Babylon was one of the leading empires in the world. So here you have, this is Egypt down here. This is the Africa here. This is the Mediterranean over here. My finger represents uh, Israel. This is Jerusalem here. Babylon is over here. This area is known as the Fertile Crescent here. So Nebuchadnezzar comes north. He doesn't want to go across the desert here. He comes north to Carchemish. He battles at Carchemish and wins. The problem is that Jehoiakim here signs a treaty with Egypt. And so that really makes Nebuchadnezzar mad. He's really mad now because what happens is Jehoiakim signs his treaty with Egypt and they form an alliance. And Nebuchadnezzar says, wait a minute. If you have Egypt and Israel together, that's going to go a threat. So he comes down, flexes his muscles, and he says, I'll show you how strong I am, invades the temple at Jerusalem, takes the holy emblems out of that temple, the candlestick and so forth, takes them out of the temple, takes Daniel captive, takes a lot of young men captive, and as he does that, he hears on August 15, 605, he hears something. He hears his father has died. Nabopolassar is his father. And so he hears, dad has died. He knows that if his father has died back in Babylon, what's going to happen? Somebody else is going to take the throne. Nebuchadnezzar says, i got to get back there. He does something amazing. He takes a small army of bodyguards, and they go straight across the desert. And they make it back home by September 15. They make it back home just in a very few weeks. Daniel, with the other group, goes the larger route around. It takes him two months to get back. In the first chapter of the first verse of Daniel, what spiritual lessons do you and I see? There's a controversy between good and evil. Evil triumphs over righteousness. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Israel, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem and besieges it. In that third year, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the city of idolatry, the city of immorality, the city of wine, the city of lawlessness overcomes Jerusalem. There are times that apparently right triumphs over wrong. But notice the next verse. It's an amazing verse. It says, and the Lord. Now, the word for Lord there is Adonai. It's a key word. If you want to spell it in English, you can spell A-D-O-N-A-I if you're taking notes, Adonai. It means that God is still in control. So Nebuchadnezzar overthrows Jerusalem. But the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So God is still in control. God allows this to happen. There are times that God allows events to happen that we may not see clearly. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with the articles of the house of God. Now, this is serious stuff because Nebuchadnezzar invades the temple at Jerusalem. 
He takes the golden candlestick that is to light the Shekinah glory of God. He takes out things like the bronze altar. He takes out the table where the showbread was on. And he takes them. He carries them to the land of Shinar. Shinar is another name for Babylon, to the house of his God. The God of Nebuchadnezzar is Belmarduk. There are 13 gods. Belmarduk is the chief god. So what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He takes these holy implements that were in Israel's temple, reflecting the Shekinah glory of the presence of God, and he puts them in a temple of a pagan god. Now the Bible goes on, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, verse 3, you'll see it there in your Bible if you're open to Daniel 1. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel. Now, if you are taking notes or you're marking in your Bible, circle the word children. And I'm going to tell you why shortly, of Israel. And some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men, again, circle young men, in whom there was no blemish. You can see this here, verse 4 on the screen. But before we do that, look at James Russell Lowell's poem. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, but beyond the dim unknown stands God keeping watch above his own. Don't you like that? Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and beyond the dim unknown stands God keeping watch above our own. Nebuchadnezzar attacks Babylon and overthrows it. Rather, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacks Jerusalem and overthrows it. But yet God is still in control and truth will one day triumph, as we'll see by the time we end tonight. Okay, so Daniel takes captive young men in whom there was no blemish. That is, no physical deformity. They had to be good looking. They were the handsomest young men of all Israel. They were gifted in wisdom. Now, if they're gifted in wisdom, they cannot be children. Possessing knowledge can't be children. Quick to understand. But I say the, the impression here is that they have, they've learned something, that they're, they're bright. They are, they're not, and you see where it says young men? The Hebrew language there is adolescence. That's a special Hebrew phrase that describes people between 15 and 18 years old. As clear as we can tell, Daniel was about 17 years old in 605. They were quick to understand. Who had ability to serve the king's palace, the royal court of the king, in whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So here's the king's idea. I'll take the brightest and the best. I'll bring these teenagers over. I will educate them in the University of Babylon. Now, I'll educate them in the language of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans, another name for Babylon. What were the languages? They were Akkadian, they were Sumerian, and they were Aramaic. So Arcadian was the language of the court. Sumerian was more of a common language. And uh, the Aramaic was a language of the scholarly community. So he would teach them all three languages. What do we know about the University of Babylon? What do we know about the courses that were taught? We know quite a bit uh, from the ancient Babylonian records. We know that they knew math very well. They, uh, they, were, they knew algebraic equations. They knew quantum physics. They were extremely bright. We knew from their building skills. They knew architecture. Uh, they were excellent builders. We knew that they explored the medical science. And so these were very brilliant scholars in uh, ancient Babylon. They understood philosophy. They knew astronomy. There were many Babylonian astronomers. They also were educated in the occult arts of Babylon. Daniel, of course, refused that, as we'll see later. So the, he chose Daniel. Why? One of the reasons he chose Daniel was this. Because they wanted to educate Daniel, change his mindset, and send him back as a puppet king to rule over Jerusalem in behalf of the Babylonian Empire. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, one of the things that they did was they brought scores of Afghani young people back to Russia, and they educated them to send them back as puppet rulers. I've been in countries recently that I don't care to name because this is a public broadcast, where I've noticed scores, thousands of foreigners to that country being brought to that country, educated in their universities. And I asked why. 
And that's a way that they can shape the mind of those students to send them back to their countries to rule in their behalf. It's a very interesting approach, but it's not a new approach. It happened in the days of Babylon. So Daniel is brought. Now imagine you're Daniel. You're 17 years old. You're marched from your homeland, never to see your father again, never to see your mother again. You're alone. You're marched into the splendor, the opulence, the wealth of Babylon. Now from among those, the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I can almost imagine Daniel being marched into Babylon. He marches through the Ishtar Gate. He sees the temple of Bel Marduk with the sun shining off it. He sees the luxury, the splendor of Babylon. He also hears the ridicule. If your God is so strong, why is Jerusalem in ruins? If your God is so strong, why do we have the vessels in the house of Bel Marduk? And notice the names of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In the Bible, a name means something. You remember, Saul was the persecutor, but Saul's name was changed from Saul to what? Paul. Remember Jacob. What does the name Jacob mean? Does anybody know? Supplanter or deceiver. But when Jacob wrestled with God, his name was changed from Jacob to what? Israel. Ah, these are good Bible students, sure. So names in the Bible meant something. When you look at the four names mentioned in Daniel 1, it says in Daniel 1 verse 7, to them the chief of the unit gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Why is it that he would change their names? The changing of names represents the changing of your identity. So for example, the name Daniel means God is my judge. In other words, God is going to set all things right. I'm a captive in Babylon, but God's going to set all things right. God rules on the throne. God triumphs over all. So his name is changed from Daniel to Belshazzar. The keeper of the hid treasures of Bel. Bel Marduk was the chief god. Remember what happened? Remember we read in Daniel 1, verse 2 and 3? that the treasures were taken from the sacred temple at Jerusalem and they were brought into the treasure house of the god of Babylon, Bel Marduk. So you can imagine the ridicule. Daniel, you're 17. Daniel, you got a future. Daniel, forget about your past. Daniel, forget about your Jewishness. Daniel, you're in Babylon now. Forget about all that business. Daniel, look, you are going to be the keeper of the hid treasures of Bel. You're going to serve in the pagan temples. 17 years old, he faces that enormous test. Now, the name Hananiah means the Lord is gracious unto me. So can you imagine that? Hananiah is in captivity in Babylon. The Lord's gracious unto me. The Lord's gracious unto me. The Lord's good unto me. That will never do in Babylon. So his name is changed to Shadrach. Now, Shadrach is very hard to translate in the... Um, in the Aramaic language, in the Hebrew language, it either means inspiration of the sun or worship of the sun, moon, and stars. It could also mean moon or sun, either one. Uh, in, most scholars will tell you that. But it, the point is, it's not the Lord is gracious unto me. The point is that, that he now has his name changed to, that you get your inspiration from one of the pagan gods. Uh, name changes, Michel. The word Michel is the name Michael. It means godlike. If a mother named her child that, you want to have the patience, the goodness, the graciousness of God. To Meshach, that means servant of the goddess of Sheba, another one of the Babylonian gods. Then you look at name changes. Azariah, the Hebrew name, the Lord's my helper. That's never going to do. So it's changed, changed to Abednego, which means the servant of Nebo. So they changed the names of each of these Israelites into Babylonian names. Why? because they wanted them to be shaped. They wanted their brains to be shaped. They wanted them to be totally immersed in the culture of Babylon. Young people were brainwashed to be sent back as puppet rulers. Let me pause for a moment here. The whole philosophy of Nebuchadnezzar was to shape the minds of these young people so that they would not have their minds on the true God. And I will be very open with you today. 
this brainwashing process is taking place in our culture. It's taking place in our culture. If you immerse your mind in the violence of television, you will not have the character to stand in the crisis at the end. If you immerse your mind in risque movies and immorality, you know, there's a principle in the Bible that says, by beholding, we become changed. And the whole goal of the kingdom of Satan is to shape the minds of men and women so that the spiritual longings of the human heart are repressed. And so that the carnal nature of human beings becomes the strongest nature that governs and guides their behavior. And so here, you know, that the principle, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, by beholding, we become changed. There's an eternal principle that says, our human minds become like that which we think about the most. If you lose the battle for your mind, you've lost the battle for your soul. If you lose the battle for your mind, you've lost the battle for your soul. What shapes our thinking processes? What shapes the way we think? What shapes what's deep down and what side of us? It's what we put in our minds. If you feed your mind with immorality, you feed your mind with violence, you feed your mind with, with, with uh, certain things of this world, you let the media feed your mind, it's going to shape your behavior. It's going to guide your behavior. These young people were to be shaped by their education in Babylon. Now, the pressure to conform to Daniel was incredibly enormous. And we come to the key verse in Daniel chapter 1, and we find it there in Daniel 1 verse 8. Let's read it together. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor the wine which he drank. We go on and it says, therefore he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I'm interested in this expression, Daniel purposed in his heart. In other words, Daniel decided. He made a decision deep within the citadel of his being. He made a decision deep inside that he was going to serve God. Every single one of us are faced from time to time with that decision. You go to a party and the wine is flowing like water. You have to purpose in your heart of what you're going to do, you know. You, uh, you go to a, a Christmas party and you're with a bunch of guys and they're telling off-color jokes. You've got to decide what you're going to do. Um, you are tempted to cheat on your taxes and you've got to make a decision. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Every single one of us, every single day, are confronted with decisions in life and it's the choices we make that determine our eternal destiny, that shape our minds, that shape our hearts. Um, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In the Bible, the heart is another word for the mind. He, another word for purposed is Daniel decided. He, he, he made a decision in the deepest recesses of his heart. You know, Proverbs 4, verse 23, read it with me, please. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. In other words, keep your mind, keep your mind. For out of it spring the issues of life. You remember that wonderful hymn writer, Isaac Newton, and uh, Isaac Watts, rather. You remember Isaac Watts. You know, Isaac Rod Watts run, wrote a number of the major hymns of the Christian church. And Isaac Watts was just a small man, and I think he wrote 800 hymns or something. And Isaac Watts, one day there was a, a parade in London for his, in his honor. And Isaac Watts is sitting in this carriage, and a horse-drawn carriage is driving him along, and he's sitting in the carriage, and uh, all the, the uh, streets in London, Regency, Regent Street and so forth, are lined with thousands of people. And there's a lady sitting up in the balcony, and she looks down, and she's amazed. I mean, Isaac Watts now is this old, shriveled-up old man, you know, and he's just so humble, and his hands are crossed like this. And she had sung those great hymns of the church, those majestic hymns. And she looks down and she kind of takes a deep breath and says, What? You're Isaac Watts? And he heard her. So he stands up to his five foot one frame. He stretches and, you know, his mind just thought in poetry. And he said, Madam, could I in fancy grasp the poles or hold creation in my span? I'd still be measured by my mind, for the mind is the measure of a man. And it is, isn't it? And it's, it's what happens here. Um, this is who we are. You are not your physical being necessarily. 
Because what if you were in a car accident and you went through the windshield and your face was all scarred up and you're all crippled? Would you lose your personhood? Would you lose your identity? Not at all. Who are we? We are that which we are inside. We are that what, the, the, we are the sum process of our thoughts. We are, we are that which we choose to be in our actions. And that's why scripture says, keep your mind with all diligence or out of it are the very issues of life. That's why Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart or mind, so what? Is he? As he thinks in his mind. How do we change our thought processes? We change our thought processes by putting in our mind that which is righteous and just and holy. We, th we change our thought processes by filling our mind with the positive things in Scripture and the positive things in the Word of God. There was an amazing experiment done by one of the Harvard, not by Harvard, but one of the Ivy League universities on the East Coast of America. And it was an experiment done with monkeys. And they wanted to find out what is the strongest drive in a monkey. So this is what they did. They took an electrode and they hooked it up to the monkey's brain. And then they went out of, they put that electrode uh, out of, and they went out of the pen to observe the monkey. They taught the monkey how to push a button inside the pen. And when the monkey pushed the button, it would send an electrical impulse through this electrode, and it would give the monkey the sensation of pleasure. So they found the pleasure center of the monkey's brain, and every time the monkey would push this button, the monkey gets this sensation of pleasure. They took the most beautiful, what do you call a female monkey? Monkey-s. monkey rest. I don't know. They took a female monkey, whatever you call a female monkey, and they put the most beautiful female monkey, they perfumed her all up, you know, and they, they put beautiful lipstick on this female monkey, you know, whatever they do to make these female monkeys look beautiful. I'm not a specialist in female monkey cosmetology. But anyway, they put this female monkey out there. And this guy presses the pleasure button, and it gives him a sensation of pleasure. He doesn't even look at this attractive female monkey. All he does is keep pressing this pleasure button. Pleasure button, pleasure button. And he's going crazy in there. He's got this big smile on his face, and he's doing all these cartwheels. Then they said, we know if we put his young out there, he will at least go to his young. He doesn't care about going to his young. He just does these pleasure cartwheels. They take food in there, and they put the food in. He won't eat. He just keeps pushing this pleasure button. The desire in the monkey for pleasure was greater than any other desire that the monkey had. Now, the interesting thing about a monkey's brain and a human being's brain is there's a major difference. In the monkey's brain, there is the pleasure center, but there is no forebrain where there's conscience, reason, and judgment. In human beings, we're not monkeys. We have conscience, reason, and judgment. Conscience tells us this is right and this is wrong. Reason says... This, this is unreliable to go down that pathway. Judgment says this is not in your best interest. So human beings are not guided, at least they shouldn't be guided. You and I are not monkeys. We're created in the image of God. And there in Daniel chapter 1, the great lesson is Daniel purposes in his heart to serve God. Daniel places in his life this great desire that all he wants to do is serve God. He purposes in his heart that he's not going to defile himself. Have you personally, in your own life, made a decision, a very fundamental decision, that the goal of your life is to please God? And then any, anything not in harmony with the will of God, you consciously choose not to do. That if you are personally convicted that this is not in harmony with God's will, you say, God, I'm not going to go down that pathway. The lesson of Daniel chapter 1 is that success in life, the blessings of God come for those that make a decision in life to please Him. Now, why wouldn't Daniel eat the food? Daniel purposed in his heart not to eat the food. Why didn't he just go eat it? For three reasons. One, the meat had been offered to idols. Daniel eats that meat. He is worshiping the idols that are there in Nebuchadnezzar's judgment hall. So he's not going to eat meat offered to idols. That's one. Secondly, it was unclean meat based on Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 14, based on his heritage, his understanding of health, Daniel's not going to eat. The Babylonians very often would offer pork, and Daniel, from his Jewish background, would not even think about that, so it was unclean meat. And thirdly, 
he knew that it was improperly slaughtered, that uh, they didn't care about draining the blood, which was part of the health principles there in the ancient time of Daniel, and which apply, of course, all down through the centuries. So Daniel makes an appeal, and he makes an appeal that he could eat a plant-based diet. Now, it's very interesting when you look at the appeal that Daniel made. See, Daniel wanted to have his brain as sharp as possible. I've been looking at studies recently in the area of Park in, in Alzheimer's disease particularly, and there's some amazing new studies that are out on Alzheimer's, and for those of us who are getting a little older, you know, that want to keep our brains sharp, there's some interesting studies. Neurophysiologists used to believe this. They used to believe that the older you get, the more brain cells you lose, and there's not much way to keep them. That's what they used to believe. Now we know that that's not necessarily true. Look, you have over 100 billion brain cells. One time I was lecturing on neurophysiology. I'm not a neurophysiologist, but I was talking about it in one of my lectures, and I said, we got about 14 billion brain cells. A neurophysiologist was in the audience. He said, I got to talk to you, Dr. Phil. And yeah. I said, okay, what are you going to say? He said, we now know there's 100 billion brain cells. I said, wow, that's a lot. I said, next lecture, I said, we got about 100 billion brain cells. A neurophysiologist, neurophysiologist was in the audience. A specialist, he came up to me and said, you know, now we know we got about 300 billion brain cells. You know what I said? Did you count them? Uh, so anyway, um, but here's the point. Here's what we know. We know today that the diet you eat not only affects your physical health and reduces coronary heart disease, but it helps to build brain cells. And we also know from the research that's being done, cutting edge new research, that a plant-based diet helps to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. A plant-based diet, the higher your diet is in fat, the higher your diet is in sugar, the more likely you'll have dementia or the more likely you'll have Alzheimer's. Now, I'm not suggesting to you if you eat three cabbage leaves and four spinach leaves and five asparagus that you'll never get dementia or you'll never get Alzheimer's. That's not the point at all. What we want to do in life is reduce the risk. That's the word, reduce the risk. We want to think as sharply and as clearly as we can for as long as possible. One of the reasons that Daniel would not eat that food is this. He knew that the rich diet of sugar and fat would keep him from being as sharp as he could in the classroom. From time to time, I'm invited to Northern Virginia Community College to lecture. And I lecture to students. I teach a seminar on how to get the best grades possible, how to have your sharpest mind possible. One of the things I teach our students is that if you're going to have a high-fat diet, and you're going to have a high-sugar diet, and if you're going to have a high-alcohol diet, we have a, studied 150 universities in America. And we can predict, based on the number of drinks that a student takes, what their grades are going to be. We know that. We know that. The, the pioneer researcher in this was Dr. Melvin Nisley. This is why Daniel, see, Daniel did, chose a plant-based diet, one, and Daniel wouldn't take the wine, number two. Why not? Dr. Melvin Nisley, now Daniel didn't know about ne Mel Melvin Nisley's studies back, uh, you know, 2,500 years ago, but God impressed him. Dr. Melvin Nisley developed an electronic microscope. He was at the University of South Carolina, that he could look at the agglutination of the blood vessels carrying blood to the brain. And so, you know, your, your white blood cells are your immunity blood cells. Your red blood cells are the oxygen-carrying cells to the brain. So Nisley, Dr. Nisley wanted to study the oxygen-carrying cells. So this is what he did. He, he began to know that the higher consumptions of alcohol made the red blood cells clump together and have less oxygen. He believed that he could predict how much drinking a student was doing. So this is what he did. He got students to volunteer to drink a certain amount of alcohol. And then he took them, and nobody knew how much they drank. So the students, he'd put one in, say, hotel room 101, one in hotel room 106, one in hotel room 105. And he took the students. And it was a blind study, so nobody knew how much they were drinking. So one student came in, and he would drink two cans of beer. Another student would drink 
four cans of beer. Another student would drink eight cans of beer over a period of time. Dr. Nisley then had those students brought to his class the next morning. He had no idea how much they drank. He put them on a table, and I've seen film of this. It's amazing stuff. He looked into their eyes with his electronic microscope, and he said, okay, you drank six, you drank two. Based on the oxygen deprivation to the brain and based on the agglutination or the sticking together of the red blood cells going to the brain. See, so Daniel knew that if he would eat that meat that was offered to idols, he'd be committing idolatry. He didn't want to do that. He knew it was in clean, improperly slaughtered. He didn't want to do that. And he knew as well that um, the plant-based diet would increase his thinking processes if he could eat a more simple diet. He also knew that the wine would keep him from uh, being the very sharpest. So the Bible says, thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies in the wine which they drank and gave them vegetables. Now, that word for vegetables is an interesting word. I need to teach you a Hebrew word. You ready to say a Hebrew word? We ready? All right. The word is zorim. Can you say it with me? Zorim. Z-O-R hyphen, not hyphen, but kind of a little dash I-M. Again, zorim. Now, zorim means this. It means vegetables, but the word also means grains. It means cereals. It means fruits. It means dates. It has to do with the plant kingdom. It is a similar word to used in Genesis 1, verse 29, where the Bible says God gave them uh, you know, fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables to eat. So Daniel says, no, I want to I eat this vegetable diet. It's interesting. It says the steward took away. Took away. You only can move forward when that which is negative is taken away. You only receive the full blessing of God when something that you've been doing in your life, you say, God, take it away. Okay, so Daniel, what's the Bible say? As for these four men. We've got to look at it in the scripture. Daniel 1, verse 17. Let's go back to the Bible. He takes it away. We're going to look at verse 14 as well. Daniel 1, verse 14. So he consents them and he tests them 10 days. Have any of you ever heard of the Daniel plan? The Daniel plan? Very popular in America today. Many physicians are discussing it, where for 10 days, you get on a real good exercise program. For 10 days, you get on the best possible plant-based diet. For 10 days, you try to get away from as much sugar as you can, and you try to sleep eight hours, drink adequate amounts of water. Like we were talking about in Imagine a Healthy 100. Some of you came. How many of you came to the Imagine a Healthy 100 class? Ah, look at that. That's wonderful. I thought you were looking better. My. I knew your eyes are, are sharper. You, 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 you bounded up those stairs. See, the reason I had class up here is because I wanted to see how the Healthy 100 class climbed the steps, you see. You've been exercising. I mean, I've seen some of you in the community. You're exercising. You're drinking water. You're coming. And I know many of you will be coming tomorrow night to natural lifestyle cooking to get on that Daniel diet. You see, there's no accent. We have these two things right in a row, you see. So, yeah, many of you will be here tomorrow night with us. And, you know, tomorrow night's different because, you know, you're going to be getting recipes you're going to be seeing vegetarian plant-based foods made, and the best thing is you're going to be eating them. You're going to have about, I don't know, how many food samples tomorrow night? Many food samples. How many, Ms. Finley? Ten food samples tomorrow night? You're going to be serving these folk. You're going to be eating all kind of whole wheat breads and rolls, and oh, it's going to be great. But anyway, I've got to go back to Daniel. I'm thinking about that food because he needs supper tonight. Okay, as for these four young men, God gave them. Now notice, this is interesting. When we, in our lives, do what we can do, God does what we can't. You with me? We do what we can do, and God does what we can't. You know, you say, you say look, I want to change in my life. I want to change in my life. You make a decision. I'm not going to view this X-rated thing any longer. You make that decision. You do what you can, but the Holy Spirit does in your mind what you can never do. You say, hey, I'm going to get more exercise. You make that decision, we do what we can, God does what we can't. We make a decision. How do you make change? Every good impulse that we have is prompted by the Holy Spirit. Whether a person is a Christian or not, every desire for right, every desire for kindness is prompted by the Holy Spirit. But when we yield to that inner conviction of the Spirit, I mean, I remember I was 17 years old, I was just becoming a Christian. 
just becoming a Christian. And a friend of mine said, hey, let's go tonight and sneak into the movie theater. So this is what we did in those days. Young man would buy one ticket to go into the movie theater. And he would go into the theater, and then when he got in the front row with his ticket, he would find over here the exit door. He would crawl on his hands and knees, open the exit door, and put a stick in the exit door. We boys would come down the street, crawl into that little lobby of the theater, which you could get out. The stick would be in the door. We'd crawl on our hands and knees, but we'd, we'd hope we could pick up a, stick, a, a, a ticket stub. You get to the front row and the usher comes down. You snuck in. Oh, I didn't sneak in. Here's my ticket stub. What are you talking about? I didn't sneak in here. The usher said, all right, sit down. So I, I remember like it was yesterday. I was just becoming a Christian. I was on my hands and knees. Now, can you see Pastor Finley, Dr. Finley on his hands and knees sneaking into some theater? I mean, that was another life. I mean, that was another life. So I'm on my hands and knees. I'm out there. And all of a sudden, this conviction comes over me. This is wrong. I mean, you're just becoming a Christian. What in the world are you doing sneaking in to this theater? Now, my first friend goes in. My second friend goes in. I'm, 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 I'm there. I'm, I'm shaking. It's like the whole, it's like I'm before the judgment bar of God. It's like every light is shining upon me. It's like my father is saying, son, fancy to meet you here. What are you doing, you know? I mean, I, I'm shaking. I got up, ran around the theater, paid my ticket and said, I wasn't convicted yet about movies. I am now. But anyway, I, I, I was teaching class one time on movies, and a young kid, eight years old, raised their hand. He was in the class and teaching a group of young people. He said, there's nothing wrong with, with, with the, the theater. It's what's in it that's bad. No. <laughs> it was interesting. He had a lot of insight. Nothing wrong with movies, nothing wrong with television, but you've got to watch what's on it sometimes. Um, here's the point. Had I made a decision that day or many other days to compromise my conscience, I wouldn't be talking to you today. The further you go down in compromising your conscience, the further you fail to purpose in your heart like Daniel did to serve God, the f once you begin to surrender your individual integrity of who you are inside as a person, and you allow yourself to be shaped by the principles around you and the Babylonian principles around you, that's when you lose the blessing of God. You have to be true to yourself. You have to be true to yourself. And you have to be true to the God that created you. And the more you learn from his word, the more he informs you of the destiny that he has for you and the purpose he wants you to be. Now, when you make a decision to serve God, it's amazing what happens. Look, as for these four men, God gave them skill, knowledge, and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and in all dreams. Unless you let God take away the hindrances, you cannot receive his blessing. So how do you receive God's blessing? First, you determine to please God. You determine that nothing in your life will allow you to be kept from pleasing God. Secondly, you allow God to take away any obstacle in your life. Anything that you see is not in harmony with his will. Third, you let God bless your life. So you want to receive God's blessings. You determine to do everything you can to please God. You allow God to take away the obstacles, and you let God bless your life. The last verse in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 1, is one of the most incredible verses in all the Bible. And I want you to look at it, and I want to meditate on it with you for a moment tonight. Here it is. Daniel chapter 1. It says, we're going to look at verse 19, 20, and 21. King Nebuchadnezzar himself, in verse 19, interviews these three young men, four young men. Then the king interviews them, and among all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. God blessed Daniel with incredible wisdom. He blessed these young men. I believe that the blessing of God is waiting to be on any young life, any middle-aged life, or any old life. God wants to bless your life in ways beyond what you could ever imagine. God wants to do something for you that you cannot possibly imagine. The blessings of God are for those that purpose in their heart to serve God. His blessings will come in ways that you can never dream. God wants to do something for your life, however old you are, however young you are. He wants to warm your heart with hope and faith and courage and blessings when we determine in our hearts to serve him. But notice the next verse, verse 20. In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, astrologers that were in his realm. The wisdom that God will give you as his child 
the blessing that God will put on your life is 10 times greater than those around you. Now, this verse is great. Verse 21, thus Daniel continued until the first year of Darius. Nations rise and fall, but Daniel continues. Nebuchadnezzar is on his throne and he dies. Then arises evil Murdoch, next king, he dies. Then comes Nabonidus, he goes. Then comes Belshazzar, he goes. The kings of Babylon rise and fall. But Daniel goes into that empire at 17. He lives in the Babylonian empire for over 70 years. He dies in his late 80s when the Medes and Persians rule. But through all those empires, kings come and go, but Daniel continues. Nation rises and falls, but Daniel continues. Daniel chapter 1 begins with a great defeat for the true God. It begins with Babylon being t overthrowing Jerusalem and Jerusalem going into captivity. But it ends with a great victory for the true God. A glorious victory for the true God. Because Daniel, for over 70 years, is a shining light in Babylon. Who rules Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar is eating grass like an oxen for seven years? I believe Daniel did. Who is put as one of the leading rulers of Darius' kingdom? Daniel 6, Daniel is. Daniel is a man of sterling integrity who cannot be bought or sold. There's a wonderful passage that goes like this. The greatest want of the world is the want of men or women who cannot be bought or sold whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole, who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Don't you think we need some people like that today? Even some of our politicians, I will not go there, <laughs> that have real integrity, that really can be trusted. Don't you think that we need a society today of people whose word means something, who are honest and who have integrity, who purpose in their heart to serve God. Whatever we study about the, the prophecies of Daniel, and next week we study a prophecy of Daniel, unless those prophecies are more than simply to fill our heads with knowledge, if prophecy is merely idle speculation to argue about, to see who's right or see who's wrong, we've missed the boat totally. The function of the book of Daniel is to help you and to help me develop a character a character of honesty and integrity, a character in which we are led to our knees in prayer, a character in which we in our heart want more than anything else to please God. I know I want that in my life. Don't you want that in your life? Hey everybody, Matt Gray here, Media Director for Hopeless 365. Don't go yet. Make sure that you subscribe and click the bell so you get notified of the next video in this series. And I think you should check out these other videos over there. I think you'll like those as well. See ya.